For a keynote speech, we have invited a professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. He is also the author of Deep Learning Revolution. He's a professor of UC San Diego, Professor uh, Terence Joseph Senyoski, and he'll be joined by Professor Kim Jong-un, who's a professor of Kais and director of GSI. So let us listen to the keynote speech by Professor Senyoski and the title of Desirable Human Resources for the Future of New Normal. For inviting me to give this keynote talk. My name is Terry Senyoski, and my lab is at the Salk Institute, but I'm also a professor at the University of California, San Diego uh, in La Jolla, which is right across the street. This lecture is going to be about education and what the future there may be for education as the new technology, artificial intelligence, distance learning. How is that going to impact the future of education? At this very moment, about half the children in the United States who should be in classrooms are actually watching a laptop uh, of their teacher trying to give lessons through this uh, new medium. Uh, and it's very stressful, it's very difficult, it's different from the classroom. Uh, interactions are much less, the teacher is fixed in place, can't walk around. Uh, but you know, this is a, a learning curve. <laughs> but, uh, and I'm gonna be telling you today about uh, experiences I've had because I've been giving uh, lectures uh, over the internet now for six years and uh, we've been very successful. And you'll be hearing more about it later in the lecture. So if you want to get an idea of change, let's go back 250 years. James Watt invented the steam engine and that greatly amplified physical power that humans were able to apply, for example, to farming so that you needed many fewer farmers. Uh, you uh, could power factories that could uh, be uh, able to produce, mass produce clothing and materials and equipment. Uh, and it took about 100 years for that to play out in the sense that uh, gradual improvements in steam engines until finally they were able to carry uh, great trains across the entire United States. We are in the middle of another revolution, which is an information revolution. And unlike the industrial revolution, which was based on physical power, the information revolution is about cognitive power. That is to say that the information that's out there is vastly going to improve our cognitive abilities. And just to give you one simple example, when I was going to school and I wanted to look up something, I had to go to the library. But today, all I have to do is Google it. Search engines can look through the entire knowledge base and within milliseconds provide me with answers uh, and you know, qu uh, specific locations, specific papers. Uh, it's really had enormous impact on all our lives. In, every aspect of our lives. Uh, shopping, for example, through Amazon. Uh, if you want to, uh, entertainment now, <laughs> nobody's going to a theater anymore with COVID or the movie theaters, uh, but they are streaming videos. And this is really a completely new way of entertaining yourself in your own home. Social media is, is revolutionized uh, and changed uh, everything. Who would have guessed that you know the internet would have such a big impact on politics. Well, that's really something nobody anticipated. Nobody knew that was going to happen, but now it's uh, going to happen on steroids. And that's because artificial intelligence is finally growing up. Many of the problems in AI that have stumped researchers for 50 years have just recently been attacked and have greatly improved. I'm going to give you a few examples and try to give you an idea of, of, of what uh, the impact might be in the future. So this is a nice little illustration because uh, it shows you here on the left the human brain and that produces human intelligence. And here we have on the right uh, this information computer system that is beginning to mimic the human brain 
through something called deep learning. Deep learning is a model of the human brain. It's a much simpler model. The human brain has evolved and is extremely complex. But in some respects, computational respects, it's able to replicate now many of the difficult problems that we solve very simply. For, so for example, seeing and hearing and, and language. Uh, these are all problems now that are, are far much more advanced uh, in artificial intelligence now that uh, artificial intelligence is uh, converging with human intelligence. Now the big transition occurred in 2016. So the world was glued, and I was also watching TV at 2 in the morning, to their TV set as E.C. Dahl played AlphaGo. AlphaGo was a deep learning system that had learned how to play Go entirely on its own by playing many, many games uh, and uh, against itself. And it had reached a point where DeepMind, who created AlphaGo, didn't know how good it had become. And so they went to one of the most famous and uh, world champions, uh, E.C. Dahl, and uh, E.C. Dahl, uh, after losing four out of five games, said, I misjudged the capabilities of AlphaGo and felt powerless. Now, what's remarkable is not that it won the games, but it's how it won the games. It came up with new positions, new moves that no human had ever thought of before, and they were winning positions. Now, what this means is that this program was creating something new. It was creative. And this is an aspect of human intelligence that was only thought to be something that humans were capable of, creativity. But here we go. Uh, in the most difficult game uh, that humans have for thousands of years played and gotten to a point where we've uh, mastered it, we learned that, in fact, uh, AlphaGo uh, was ahead of us. Language was always thought to be the most difficult problem because only, again, only humans have a, na a natural language. Now, the problem with language is there are so many of them. And as you can see, uh, it's uh, almost mutually incomprehensible between different cultures. And this causes all sorts of problems. So language translation is a very difficult problem. And deep learning changed all that, a huge advance. Uh, and again, it was Google that uh, put together a deep learning program that could translate between languages. And it's gotten to the point now where it's actually uh, very, very practical and usable. Not only can it translate written text, but it can also, with speech recognition, another capability that uh, AI has provided us uh, through deep learning, uh, it can also take, for example, you can talk uh, with Korean into, the, uh, into these apps. And it will not just translate it into English, it will speak it in English. Now this is, until recently, was considered science fiction. Uh, there was a science fiction TV program called Star Trek back in the 60s, in the 20th century. And here is, the, is Captain Kirk holding something that they called the Universal Language Translator. Now this was, you know, back then considered uh, a, a, a completely impossible according to all of the uh, the technical technology that was available at the time, and you know the, uh, the 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 idea that you could hold it in your hand and actually translate between languages, including in this case between English and Klingon. This is Spock, was you know something that uh, we didn't I didn't think would ever happen in my lifetime, but it has. An even more impressive uh, la linguistic feat was uh, accomplished just this year by uh, OpenAI. Uh, and it's called the Generative Pre-Trained Transformer, GPT-3. This is the program that was trained on the entire language base, text base of the internet. So a trillion words, in including you know, the entire Wikipedia. And, uh, and it was a very simple task. It was just to predict the next word. Now, despite the fact that uh, it, it didn't require any tr teacher, it just uh, completely unsupervised, it just supervised itself and got so good at predicting the next word that it could actually create whole paragraphs, whole stories. It was generating language. And not only that, but it could uh, answer questions 
It could even write computer programs because it's all out there and it created an internal model of everything, uh, all, all of the complexity of language. Uh, here's a company called Simplify that is using GPT-3 for a, 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 an interesting language problem, which is uh, can you simplify a paragraph to make it more easy to understand? Okay, so I, I put in here a couple sentences from a grant proposal uh, that I was writing. And so here's, here's, here's my English uh, 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 writing. Human intelligence is more than intellectual problem solving. Humans have to navigate a social world that entails understanding the internal states and intentions of others from external cues. So I thought that was a pretty good you know, introduction for our grant proposal. So here's what Simplify turned out to be. Uh, the human mind is not just about solving problems. It is about understanding other humans. Humans have to understand internal states and intentions of others from external cues. I wish I could have written something this clear and direct, but <laughs> there you go, GPT-3. You're going to be hearing much more about it. I've written a book that uh, tells the story of the deep learning revolution. It's an origin story. How did it start? Where did it come from? It started in the 1980s. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton and I created one of the first learning algorithms for uh, multi-layer neural networks. And, uh, and, and the book tries to give you that background, but also gives you a, a sense for where the field is today and, and where the applications are going. And uh, I'm often asked when I give keynote talks, you know, what's going to be the, the, the really breakthrough application, the killer app? And I always tell them it's going to be education. Because education is really going, it's labor intensive, it's very difficult, requires excellent skills. The teachers has difficult time controlling large classes. And if we can make a breakthrough using AI, it's going to have a massive impact on education, but also on uh, the, the future of our children. Now this book uh, has been translated into Korean. So if you're at all interested, I highly recommend that you take a look and see what, uh, what else is there. Because I only have this lecture is just touching on a few of the details that are in the book. This is uh, a paper that was written by uh, uh, two teams, one of them at uh, UCSD uh, and the other one at University of Washington. And uh, what we tried to do is to uh, put together uh, a, a, a glimpse from uh, new things that were beginning to happen, bubble up. This was uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, th there were, we were learning much, much more about the brain from, in neuroscience and, and how the brain learns. Uh, we were also uh, beginning to use machine learning. And of course, deep learning is, a, is an example of, of machine learning algorithm. Uh, but also uh, psychologists and educators were also looking for new ways to try to improve teaching methods. So uh, our center focused on the neuroscience, the brain, and machine learning. And uh, the University of Washington focused on how children learn language and how they communicate with, with adults. So this is really uh, a, a, a really interesting <laughs> mixture. It was funded by the National Science Foundation and it was um, very successful. And I'm gonna give you one example from it. So uh, for the rest of the lecture, I'm gonna focus on three different topics. One of them is about how brains learn. The second one is going to be about uh, using machine learning to create social robots in the classroom. And then the final topic is going to be uh, a massive open online courses. And uh, one of the MOOCs that I was participating in that has really changed the way I think about uh, 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 learning over the internet. So here's an experiment. And it's a very simple one. The goal is to try to figure out, uh, using mice, if exercise could improve learning. Because if that's true, and, and that's, uh, we, we have to prove that, then uh, it has implications for how we, uh, sh the, what the classroom should look like and how children should be uh, integrating exercise with their classroom studies. 
So uh, we have two groups of mice, one with an exercise wheel, as you can see here, and the other one without. Uh, the first thing we did was to test them uh, over several days to see if they could find an underwater platform, which they did. And then uh, we looked in their brains and we looked into the part of the brain that's very important for long-term learning called the hippocampus. And it's known that there are new neurons that are born in the hippocampus. Uh, th and this is something that has only been discovered very recently. It was thought that you have all the neurons you're ever going to have when you're born. But no, it turns out that new ones are, are always being born in the part of the brain that has to learn new things. And then the other uh, test that we did, which is in my lab, was to uh, test to see the strength of the synapses and how they responded to stimuli that uh, increased the strength of the synapse. And uh, by, uh, it was a collaboration with Rusty Gage, who uh, is now the president of the Salk Institute, uh, a very uh, a co close colleague of mine. OK, so that's the experiment. What were the results? So here is the results of the learning test. OK, so this is the uh, time it takes to find the hidden platform as a function of trials over six days. And as you can see, uh, with each day, uh, and this is averages over many mice, uh, if they get faster and faster and faster, starting at 40 and then ending up here uh, between 10 and 20. But you'll notice that the runners, the one that had the exercise wheel, they are doing better than the sedentary ones that had to sit in the cage all day. Aha! So you can indeed learn faster and better if you have exercise, the opportunity to exercise. Now what about the the newborn cells in the hippocampus. Well, they're labeled red here. And you can see these are the ones from the hippocampus of a runner. And there are more red cells here than there are here. Now, that's interesting because the rate at which they're formed is the same. But apparently, if you run, uh, the, the, uh, the, they're turning over. If you run, they last longer. They, they get incorporated into the circuit and they're used. But if you don't learn anything new, if you don't exercise, they're going to disappear. So, wow, so that's really something because we can see the, the exact physiological and anatomical substrate, we think, of this process of, of, of how exercise affects uh, your ability to learn. And finally, and this is my result, uh, here is the strength of the synapse. Here's the, it's a slice, and we stimulate with one electrode. We record with another one. And this is the strength of the, of the synaptic contact from the stimulus. And so uh, as you can see here, uh, this is the, actually the change. Uh, we we're stimulating it with one pulse, one pulse, one pulse. And here we stimulate it with a, a high-frequency burst. And that's known to produce a, a jump. That's called long-term potentiation. And you can see that for the sedentary mice, it was very stable, about 25% increase. But if you ran, if you looked at the runners, that increases beyond 50%, doubles the amount of the strength of the synapses. So here we have uh, the smoking gun. This is it. This, you, can, you can really uh, appreciate that we're, we're living in an age now where children are not allowed to go out to run anymore. Um, you know, they're, they're cooped up. Uh, classrooms are cooped up. They've given up on recess uh, where kids ran around, at least when I was young. Uh, and, uh, you know, gym. Uh, you know, we used to go have to take a class, but now they don't have gym anymore. Uh, they're going in exactly the wrong direction. Okay, now the second topic is going to be social robots. So, you know, we think of robots as being, you know, huge and lunky and so forth, but no, uh, they don't have to be. And, and also, we want to be able to communicate with them. Well, with artificial intelligence, that's become possible. So I want to tell you about a project that came out of our center. I told you that we had the Science of Learning Center. Uh, and this particular center, uh, as I said, really focused on uh, what we know about the, 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 you know, the, the social parts of, of interactions between uh, machine learning and humans. So here is Ruby. Ruby is a social robot. This is the first version, version one. Uh, Ruby was, was very, uh, you know, for a robot, it's uh, about the same size as a, a, a little 18-month-old toddler. These are preschool children. And uh, Ruby has uh, two cameras for eyes, and it has expressive eyebrows, and it has a Teletubby, so it can actually instruct uh, to teach the kids. 
And what's going on here is very interesting. The little child is pointing towards something, and Ruby is looking at it. Now, this turns out to be critically important. Toddlers have very short attention spans. You know, if they'll pick up a toy, and if it's not interesting, they'll throw it down in five or ten seconds. And so what was important was that Ruby has to, in order to keep the toddler's attention, has to respond within a second to uh, anything that the, 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 the child is trying to do, trying to give a, a block to the Ruby or uh, point at the clock and so forth. So this is really uh, something that developed, and we learned an enormous amount from interacting with these children, and the children did begin to learn from Ruby. Now, we were afraid that the teacher would be very upset because the teacher might be uh, you know, thinking that, well, I'm going to lose my job. This uh, Ruby is really doing a great job. The kids love Ruby. In fact, when we had to take Ruby out to have uh, you know, new software, the children were upset. And they said, where's Ruby? And we had to say that, well, Ruby's sick today, and then you know, we'll bring him back tomorrow. So uh, this, I think, is, uh, it tells you the extent to which it became part of the class. But in fact, the teachers were extremely happy to have an assistant because the, inevitably there's crowd control problems. And so if Ruby could take care of some part of the group, the teacher could then focus on a couple of other kids that are maybe having trouble. So it really turned out, that, and I think this is the way the future is going to go, I really think that uh, having uh, social robots is going to vastly enhance our ability to do our job better. And, I, and I, this was an example in our, our own experience. Now. Uh, so here's what it looks like if you're a child and you're at home and you're trying to learn mathematics remotely. Uh, it, it is not nearly as effective and there's a lot of frustration. Kids are you know, refusing to uh, engage. Uh, they, they feel frustrated. And so how can, how can we improve that? We, we have to come up with a better way to, to work across the uh, internet. Well, that's where uh, the MOOCs come in, Massive Open Online Courses. They started about 10 years ago, and uh, there's now tens of thousands of these courses. And one of them is called Learning How to Learn, and uh, this is with Coursera. And it was a partner, my partner Barbara Oakley and I put together a series of short, you know, five, ten minute clips, uh, which try to... Uh, explain to students how their brain works, number one, and how to improve their ability to learn. So let me give you a feeling for what's in the course. Uh, so here uh, is uh, Barbara, and uh, the course uh, was four weeks, uh, each week, uh, three to four hours in short five, ten minute clips. Uh, it was in English, however, su subsequently it's been translated into 20 languages, including Korean. It's totally free. And uh, if you want to, you can get a certificate. You have to pay a little bit. But uh, a lot of people uh, f find it valuable to have the certificate when they're looking for a job. So here's the uh, layout. We have four weeks. The first week is going to be devoted to the basics of learning. What's the goal of learning? Uh, practical information about uh, things that may help uh, the students who are having problems, such as exam anxiety, or uh, what do you do when you're uh, having trouble with uh, procrastination? Practical advice, but based on neuroscience. And the importance of things like exercise and sleep. Memories are consolidated during sleep. So if you don't have good sleep or not enough of it, that can also hurt the learning. So these are really basics that we're teaching the kids. I wish someone had taught me this when I was in school. <laughs> OK. Uh, now. The second one goes into a deeper cognitive aspect of learning, which has to do with chunking. So if you learn a lot of facts, it's really hard to uh, figure out how to organize them. But the brain puts them together uh, that are related to each other in, in a, to a chunk. And the reason why that's very important is that uh, there's a limited number of ways that your brain can manipulate facts. But if you chunk them, then it's able to uh, interact at a much higher level with many, many more facts. So we give them uh, advice about how to go about chunking, uh, the importance of interleaving, for example. And again, uh, these are all tried and true. They have been tested by psychologists, and, and we know, what we think, <laughs> we understand some of the aspects uh, in the brain which are responsible for uh, th things like uh, chunking and memory consolidation. 
Now, the, the, the other parts of the course were focusing on how to help the child uh, become a, a better learner, more able to uh, achieve the potential. All children have great potential. But if they don't have the right environment, if they don't have the right t assistance and teaching and, and nurturing and, and actually even the right diet, then their brain is not going to develop at, at, to its full potential. And so we really tr try to help the students to uh, be able to have successes. It's really important that you see the results that, you know, that you've, effort you've put in, you see the results, and that gives them more confidence. And so that's the purpose of our course is to try to get children through to the point where they actually are, are going to be uh, much better later on in life uh, in, in whatever they choose to do. So here's Barbara. Now, uh, our, our MOOC was incredibly successful. It was wildly popular, wildly. I mean, it was unbelievable how many people took the course. It was way beyond anything I have ever could have guessed. And, and he, what we tried to do here was to dissect the methods that we used. And here's, here's our, our, uh, our philosophy. Our philosophy is that if you're going to be in front of a screen, then you're going to have to do something to keep the attention of the, the learner. And so we use all sorts of techniques from media what the, the, that are used by television uh, people, uh, people in the movies, in order to be able to keep things moving along so that you don't get bored. Now, the, 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 the most boring thing that, that you can imagine is a talking head. In other words, there's a teacher sit, standing there, sitting there, and is, is going on and on and on. Uh, you know, that you lose, you lose uh, your t uh, concentration very, very rapidly. It's very difficult. But if things are changing, every once in a while, then uh, that'll maintain some attention. Now, we also did, we did this by actually projecting things onto a green screen. You can see that Barbara's standing in front of the green screen. She's pointing at something which is actually going to be filled with a head that's moving. And, uh, and, and it, it, this is all done to maintain your attention, and it's very effective. But uh, if you're at all interested, this paper was published just last year in the uh, Nature Science of Learning. Uh, what we learned from creating one of the world's most popular MOOCs. So here are, here are the numbers. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so we've more than 3 million learners have viewed our lectures. That's about 100 times more than I've ever taught in the classroom my entire career. Every day, 1,000 new learners join. The, uh, the, 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 uh, the MOOC, and that's, you know, that's a phenomenal number, if you think about it. It's over 350,000 new learners a year. And uh, about 100,000 actually thought it was important enough to actually spend a little money to get a certificate. So this is really quite remarkable, quite remarkable, and, and way beyond what I expected. So here's some uh, statistics about uh, geography. About a third of the learners are from North America, but uh, there's also a substantial amount of learners in Europe and Asia. And in fact, we've got learners from all 200 countries, from all the continents. What was their background? Well, here's something interesting, uh, things that we never anticipated. Two thirds of the learners are male, one third are female. And by the way, that's true of all the MOOCs. And here's the surprise. I, I told you that we're aiming it at college students and High school students, right? Well, here we go. 13 to 19, three percent. What, what you know, we didn't. We, we were flabbergasted, and the reason is that well, they actually have a job. It's their business to learn, and they do that all day. The last thing they want to do is take another course, you know. But nonetheless, uh, it was very popular with the age group 20 to 29. Uh, why is that? Well, we can see down here that. Uh, if the backgrounds, uh, if, if we look at people who had bachelor's degree, master's, professional school degree, you know, law, medicine, or doctorates, PhDs, that constituted 75% of all of the learners, 75%. These are people who are already well-educated. Now, why are they taking our MOOC? Well, the reason is that they are now in the workforce. They uh, can't go back to school to get new skills. That, you know, they may have families, they may have mortgages, they have jobs. And so this is a way for them to uh, improve their learning skills 
to be able to learn new things that they need for their job. But uh, as you can see, it extends all the way to 70. So we have learners all the way from uh, you know, very young to very old. And in fact, uh, we decided that we would try to uh, reach the younger children uh, by writing a book, which we did here, uh, Learning How to Learn for Kids. Uh, we also reshot our whole MOOC uh, for that age group. Uh, and this has become a bestseller. It's actually selling. Now, what I find very satisfying is that I get fan mail every day. I get, you know, uh, you know I could spend all day reading letters from people who say that it's changed my life. I, you know, really had trouble with uh, procrastination and you helped me. Um, and, you know, it's really, it's, it is very satisfying because it did really have affect these people. It touched them. But I want to read for you a letter from, my favorite letter, from a fifth grader. She's 10 years old. Uh, and as you can see, she addresses it to us, dear professors. I took my final exams and it was great. I am in grade five. My mom was browsing through Coursera and pestered, I pestered her to make me join in. She chose this course for me. I am thankful for that. I never knew that professors were very witty and the entire course was fun learning. This is clearly a very smart little girl. Of course, I had to refer to a dictionary for the scientific terms used, like hippocampus. But it was great learning. I, ha I have learned to overcome the discomfort in my stomach as I enter the exam hall by using the breathing technique. It really works. Now I have learned to face exams as a tool to understand how much I have learned and retained. I love the Pomodoro technique. That's for procrastination. It really works. My mom did a role play in the entire course. She played the opposite. She crammed her brain with video lectures. She binge watched. You know, in other words, every week we release about you know, 20 uh, snippets. And uh, we say that you should space them because that's the way you maintain things, by spacing. And she just watched them through right, right off the bat. And that's the worst thing you can do, uh, grouping them. She did not take rest and did not even sleep before the day I took the final test. Though she is much smarter than me, she could not do as well. I was amazed that simple techniques helped me to score better and of course, without any pressure of exams. Thanks a ton, professors. I wish you could come up with part two of this course. Wow, you know, so that really uh, made my day and I, I still love reading it. Okay, well, here's my last slide, and I want to look back and try to th throw some perspective. I've given you three examples of what you might expect in the future as we learn more about the brain and, and can help people learn better because we, we can give them some real advice, scientific advice. But more importantly, uh, there is going to be a new technology that will allow us to be able to use uh, uh, learning over the internet with much, much more effectiveness. This is just the beginning. where you have just taken our first, first few, few steps. And, and I think we're back in the early days of aviation. Remember that when the Wright brothers, over 100 years ago at Kitty Hawk, were the first with a man-powered flight. You know, it was proof of principle. Well, that's where we are today. We're just at the beginning. Artificial intelligence uh, based on Deep learning has only been around for you know, 10 years or less, and uh, it's going to get much, much better and, and much, much more powerful. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, it'll probably be in 100 years the equivalent of a jet plane compared to what we have today. So uh, it was a pleasure for me to have this opportunity, and I look forward to the panel discussion for some of your questions. And thank you. Uh, ter Professor Taryn Sanofsky, can you hear my voice? Can you hear me, Professor Sanofsky? Can you hear my voice? Are you listening to the translation? Can you hear my voice, Professor Sanofsky? Hello, I can hear you. Uh, 영어로, uh, 들리, 들리. So I am speaking in Korean. Can you listen to the translation? Can you hear me? English or you can hear Korean? I can uh, hear you, uh, but I will try to uh, go into the, uh, the English uh, translation.
translation. Professor Taran Sinovsky, you talked about the future of education. It was a moving, a remarkable presentation, so thank you for that. For the next 20 minutes, I would like to engage in a conversation with you. So, Professor, in Korea right now, we are broadcasting live the results of the presidential elections. Did you vote in your election, Professor? I did. I cast my vote, and uh, this is uh, an important part of democracy. We all have to uh, make our choices. And we, we, as you know, we still haven't uh, come up with a decision yet because there are still votes that are being counted. So we may not know for several days. Yeah. Yes, I understand. But recently, uh, these were some thoughts that came to my mind. A AI, if it becomes so intelligent, it could just read our minds, we don't have to vote, and it just reaches a conclusion. We will not have to vote because of AI. And AI can make predictions about the voting results. So for we don't have to you know, stay up all night watching television for the results. What do you think? Well, uh, you know, I'm not sure I would trust AI to read my mind. Uh, I think that what AI is going to be very good at is helping us become be better voters. That is to say, uh, able to give us uh, better information and allow us to uh, make better decisions. But I, I don't think it's going to replace humans or uh, take away our decision making. Uh, but we'll have to wait and see. So in that respect, I think we differ a little, a little bit in our views, but we will talk about that later on. I majored in semiconductors and computers for AI, so it's actually more powerful than what people had initially expected. And so I do think that uh, AIs will be able to read the minds of people eventually. But anyhow, we'll talk about that later. In one of the photos, you showed us the Light Brothers plane, and that was in the Kitty Hawk Coast. And five years ago, I wanted to see that site. So I actually went to Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. And so I drove all the way there. And there was a, a sandy hill there. It was very windy. And so I was able to see the adventure spirit, and I wanted to learn about their creativity also, because I wanted uh, uh, the Korean youth to have such creativity as well. So I have that photo on my desk. So it's exactly the same photo that you showed during the presentation. So I think like minds, we have like minds, we think alike. Great minds think alike. So you, you see, Talk. Now we have a lot of development. We have jet planes. We're going to space. AI began just 10 years ago. So what will be the future of AI technology? How do you imagine that? Well, uh, my view is that uh, we are going to uh, enter a completely uh, new world where uh, we are uh, going to have uh, an enormous uh, enhancement of our cognitive power. Uh, just as in the industrial age, which occurred 250 years ago, when the steam engine became available, it amplified human physical power. And, you know, that's uh, made possible our civilization that we have today. But now we're entering an age of information. This is the of, of great uh, in, in, you know, explosion of information on the internet, uh, scientific experiments, uh, Google. I mean, the internet is really changing things very rapidly. And uh, in, able to, uh, in order to uh, analyze the data and uh, be able to use it effectively, uh, artificial intelligence will uh, have that capability. AI needs a tremendous amount of computer power and the chips that you're working on will make that possible. But it also needs a lot of data and, and, and that's now become available. So I think that, that this is just the beginning, the very first steps, but uh, the equivalent of a jet is probably not more than about uh, you know 50 years ahead of us. 네. 
저는 쪽. Yes. Well, I've tried to use my imagination these days. With the steam engine, we experienced the first industrial revolution, and we were able to replace some of the labor work back then. But if you look at AI and big data, I think that there are some new aspects, different aspects. Do you use uh, a navigation when you drive? Well, do you drive or does the machine drive? Well, the computer, although the performance of the computer has improved greatly and there's more data, the computer uh, has become smarter. And I think that the computer, the machine will continue to work. But at the same time, perhaps we might be in the future providing very cheap labor. So I think that perhaps there might be a reverse uh, role played by machine, the computer, and humans in the future. Now, semiconductors, that's my field. Uh, now, but anyhow, do you think my imagination has gone too far? Uh, I understand that uh, you have majored in neural computation, but do you think my imagination can become a reality? What do you think about the future? Well, uh, the famous philosopher of the New York Yankees, Yogi Berra, uh, once said that it's very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Nah. <laughs> and and nah. uh, I'm not sure that we're, our imagination is really good enough to uh, imagine the future in this case with the new technology. And to give you an example of that, I want you to th go back to uh, nah. the 1990s. And, and I mean, I was here uh, and, and, you know, I was working on my, uh, it was a, 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 you know, the, the beginning, that was the beginning of uh, neural pioneer, I helped pioneer neural network learning algorithms. And so I remember very clearly the transition that occurred when the internet suddenly became open. And just think, could anybody back then, I could not have imagined every, how, what impact it would have on every aspect of my life, right? Uh, you know, Google has made it, possible for me to be omniscient for all practical purposes. I can look up any fact. It's affected uh, entertainment. It's affected social media. It's even affected politics, every aspect of our life. And I don't think anybody could have predicted that. So I think that we are going to have a similar transition occurring over the next 25, 50 years that no one could possibly imagine. And uh, you may be right. I mean, there's no, no you know, we don't know. Uh, it, 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 there may be many possible futures. We just don't know. I also uh, am studying artificial intelligence a little bit. You talked about GPT-3 earlier, and there are over 190 million parameters applied, I understand. So the if you look at the sentences made by GPT-3, they're actually remarkable. And another AI technology is GEN. And uh, when creativity is added to that, what remains for people to do then? So in this conference, we are talking about that issue also. But in the, uh, in the 90s, the internet developed to change the world. And so we may have another such change in the future or not. But what kinds of human resources will we need in the future? Are we going to coexist with AI? Are we going to become smarter people who can utilize AI and become happier people? I mean, what kind of human resources or talents should we foster to prepare for the future? Uh, Korean scientists, the policymakers in Korea, many of them are watching right now. So could you share with us your idea on, yeah, on the kinds of human resources needed? Well, I, I'd like to answer your question by looking back historically. And one of the uh, seminal uh, moments in the history of AI was when ch there was a chess program that could beat the human. And everyone said, well, this is the end of chess for humans that we can't compete. You know, AI is just uh, in this uh, narrow domain was much better than any human. Uh, you know, the, it beat the Grand Master, Kiri uh, Kasparov. And uh, fast forward today, humans are still playing chess and guess who is the, uh, the, the, the world champion? Uh, it's a young Norwegian 
boy who grew up in a small village. Now, the reason that's significant is that it used to be uh, before chess machines were as good as the best humans, uh, chess programs, uh, you had to go to a big city like Moscow and you had to be in a club with grandmasters because you had to play grandmaster to become a grandmaster. But now it's democratized chess. So anybody in any part of the world who has a talent can become uh, a grandmaster by playing against the, a, a chess uh, machine. And the same thing is beginning to happen with Go. I mean, I mean Go really was uh, in a different uh, level completely from humans. And now humans are beginning to learn from AI how to play better. And so I think the same thing is going to happen. And, and let me go out on a limb here and say that I think the biggest impact of AI will be on education. I've, my whole lecture was about how, uh, you know, understanding more about the brain will allow us to become better learners and uh, the, the a uh, real the, the the something I didn't mention, which is that uh, better the best form of education is when you have a one-on-one -on -one discussion between a, uh, an adult and a child. That adult who knows the child and can help the child get over mental blocks and things. Well, AI will provide that. Will prov and it's very labor-intensive. You know, we can't do that in our educational system. We have uh, you know 20, 30, 40 children per class. Of, of a wide range of, of, of backgrounds and, and abilities. But if we have a personal tutor, AI tutor for every child, then that will bring out the best in every child. And I think that's where we're going to go is that this is going to vastly enhance our, our labor force, uh, our ability to uh, become um, you know, uh, artists, scientists, you name it. I think this is going to be the golden age for human accomplishments. 네. 어. Thank you. 아까 교수님께서 talked about learning how to learn the program and you talked about how you uh, use that to interact with children and I was able to take a look at the letter that you received. It was really impressive and very touching. I'm a professor, but I've never received such a letter in my life, so I congratulate you on that. Now, one of my concerns is, since you're a professor as well, I'm thinking about whether professors will be needed in the future. Do you think that the profession of professors will continue? Uh, I, I think uh, the answer is that it will be transformed. That is to say, uh, I don't think professors will be needed to give lectures, to stand up in front of an audience and uh, of, of students and uh, teach them how to do uh, algebra, right? Uh, it, we'll, we'll have that, that that'll be done uh, and in a way that will be much more effective by AI. I, 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 in fact, I'm... <laughs> writing a grant proposal for uh, an AI augmented educational system, right, for us institute that will be producing that uh, the AI. Uh, but here's where humans are still gonna be vastly more uh, uh, important, and that is through uh, being mentors with children, uh, you know, being role models and, and interacting with them in terms of the social aspects of uh, motivation, um, you know, what to expect in life, what, what to do, you have to make a decision. Uh, these are very difficult decisions children have to make. I mean, the, the things like, uh, you know, should I become a, a scientist? Um, what, what am I gonna need, uh, you know, my, with, given my background, what, what should I be doing to become a scientist? I mean, th th this is where we can really have a big impact. And, and right now, unfortunately, teachers are spending most of their time with pedagogy in front of a class and and that's that's something that uh i think we can uh help out ai can help out with that we don't have to have humans doing that it's it's a very it's a very labor it's very difficult by the way it's, it's tremendously teachers i have a lot of respect for them because they put a huge amount of effort in and it's, it's a very important job uh, 교수님께서 you 
offered a course entitled Learning How to Learn, and you continue to teach that. What about learning how to teach? Maybe you could develop that program. Are you interested? Learning how to teach for people like me. So you need teachers to learn how to learn. So you will need programs that teach learning how to teach. So how we can use AI and virtual reality as teachers to move the hearts or motivate the students. And so what the areas that the machine cannot do, uh, you know, I could touch on that. So can you make that promise today? So I am willing to pay to receive a certificate that you mentioned. So, you read my mind. Uh, I, we, I just, Barbara Oakley and I just finished a, a new book, uh, which is meant for teachers. It's, the title yeah. is Uncommon Sense Teaching. And it, it's precisely what you were, wanted. Uh, you'll, you'll be very pleased that it's, it's, it's a way for bringing neuroscience to the teacher and explaining that, that how the brain, we have different types of uh, learning and memory systems uh, and how to, how to take advantage of that. And, uh, and, and so uh, we, we really hope that this book will help uh, you and any other teacher who want to become better teachers. I, you know, so that, you, know, you, you really put your finger on it. Yes, actually, I do something better than AI. That is reading the minds and hearts of people. You might not believe me, but that's one of my talents. So, now, AI, Neuralink, semiconductors and computers. I've been researching these topics. At the same time, I'm trying to predict, look into the future. And in the future, I was thinking perhaps the worst case scenario might be the reverse role played by the computer and human beings. But I do believe that uh, we have many things to look forward to. I also try to make a bold prediction. Uh, I think that there can be four categories, majoring AI, selling AI, managing AI, or not doing anything. So with just four categories in place, in order to program and understand AI, you need to have a good understanding of algebra and coding capabilities. But to the layman, this can be very difficult to achieve and understand. Now, the Minister of Education, I had a chance to talk with him. And I told him that children have to learn coding like uh, they learn language when they're very young. And the minister opposed actually saying that it's too much. But what do you think uh, teaching that to the children when they're very young? You, you are very wise. And the earlier that uh, young children can learn how to code, the better off they're going to be in their later life, no matter what they want to do. No, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, you, we're in the age of information and the tools for manipulating information is the computer and programming the computer to do what we want it to do with that information is really the future. And so I, I completely agree with that. Uh, and it's not that difficult. It turns out that children can pick this up <laughs> really quickly. It's the adults that have the problem, you know, if they haven't been exposed to it early enough, but you know, kids are like four or five years old, right? They're, they're programming and they love it. And, the, and by the way, it's the girls too. It's not just the 네. boys, it's the girls. 네. 저는... Yes, and I also have another a personal philosophy. We learn how to speak, whether it's Korean or English. That is a human to human communication method. But in terms of communicating with nature, I think we learned that through math. So it's a way for us to understand nature and communicate with nature. But if it, we come into an age where computers do everything, then we will have to communicate with computers. So that was the uh, reasoning behind my question. So my last question is the following. According to your research, the more you exercise, you become smarter. The brain be functions better. So it's the same for humans, right? So when we exercise, when we move around, 
、uh, we have clearer minds, we become smarter, but we sweat at the same time. And while I was listening to your presentation, I was thinking, how do computers exercise? Do computers sweat also? So I was imagining that. What about you? What are your thoughts? And I apologize. This is really a weird question, but I believe the、uh, time is up. I'd like to ask you for your closing remarks. There are a lot of Korean viewers watching you right now. Particularly, this program is viewed by the youth a lot, so they're wondering how to prepare for the future. What is an ideal future HR? What policy recommendations you can make? Well, first, first of all,、uh, Philip K. Dick, a science fiction writer, once wrote a novel, the title of which was "Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep?" <laughs> And the answer is yes. I think、uh, just as humans have to sleep to reorganize their experiences and 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 consolidate their knowledge, I think that、uh, computers are also going to have the, the something similar.、Uh, in fact,、uh, Jeffrey Hinton and I、uh, created something called the Boltzmann machine, which had to sleep in order to be able to learn properly. Now, in terms of what to expect in the future.、Uh, It's things are moving so rapidly now, and it's so、uh, exciting in science,、um, in AI. You said you know it was just ten years ago that deep learning、uh, is on the scene. It's already made huge impact, huge impact on、uh, many many applications in vision, hearing, moving, robotics, and so forth. And and it, it's really we don't really know how far we can take it.、Uh, It may require some new breakthroughs, and I think it's a really exciting time to be young and to be working in this area. So I, I really, I think you, you, you know, the audience in Korea are really、uh, perfectly positioned to take advantage of this new age that we've entered. 네교수님 Yes, professor. I have not yet your book. But today, or perhaps during the weekend, I will go to the bookstore to purchase your book, and I look forward to your upcoming work, your upcoming books, and I I look forward to your ha learning how to teach、uh, sessions as well. Thank you very much. You are very welcome, and I very appreciate this opportunity. 네고맙습니다여러분박수 Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. A big round of applause for Professor Sepnowski and Professor Kim Jong Ho. Thank you for your insightful lecture and discussion.